Regardless of whether someone is on a plan or a waiver, the same services are delivered to the client and all IL services are short-term in nature. There are five core services in the independent living program. They are information and referral, independent living skills training, peer counseling, individual and systems advocacy, and transition services. Information and referral can be provided to anyone, even if they do not have a disability. Additionally, someone does not have to be an active IL client in order to receive this service. Examples of information and referral are information about resources, responsibilities, or their rights. These services can be provided individually, in a group setting, in person, or over the telephone. Independent living skills training are just that, teaching someone the skills they need in order to be independent. This can include things like food preparation, social skills, training, personal grooming, shopping, or budgeting. These are intended to be broad life skills and not just basic survival skills. Peer counseling involves creating relationships involving mutual support and assistance among individuals with significant disabilities who are actively pursuing IL goals. Peer counseling is provided to IL clients by another individual with a disability. Peers can meet one-on-one -on -one or as a group to discuss issues related to their disability. The individuals involved in peer counseling do not need to have the same disability. They can be cross-disability peer support groups. Individual and systems advocacy assists IL clients in developing skills needed to advocate on their own behalf. This includes community awareness, assistance in obtaining access to benefits, and assistance to obtaining access to other services and programs which the client may be eligible for. Examples of this service are assisting someone to apply for disability benefits or assisting them to advocate for accessibility at home or in the workplace. Transition services are the newest core service. They were added with the passage of WIOA, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. When I think of transition services, I kind of think of three separate services. Um, the first one is to deter an individual from entering a nursing home or institution. In other words, providing some service to help someone stay independent in their own home so that they don't end up needing to enter a nursing facility. The second piece that I think of is helping someone who's already living in a nursing home or institution return to their community by transitioning them out of the nursing facility. The third piece is to assist students um, or transition students from secondary education to post-secondary life. In addition to the core services, this is a list of other services available under independent living services. In the interest of time today, I won't go into a definition of each of these, but examples of some of them are helping someone to secure housing or transportation, assisting in the acquisition of assistive technology, installation of a ramp on a person's home, helping someone to acquire a grab bar or reacher, and training in the use of an assistive technology device. Um, so now that we've talked about the services, where do you get independent living services? We have three centers for independent living in South Dakota. There's independent living choices, Native American advocacy services, and Western resources for independent living. Um, the slide you're looking at right now has their websites, which you can access for addi additional information about each center. ILC's main office is in Sioux Falls and they cover the eastern portion of South Dakota and have locations in Aberdeen, Brookings, Mitchell, Huron, Watertown, and Yankton. Native American Advocacy Program has their main office in Herrick and they cover the reservation areas of the state and they have an additional presence in Eagle Butte. WRIL is based out of Rapid City, covers most of the western portion of South Dakota with additional offices in Pure and Spearfish. And this is just a map showing the service area of each Center for Independent Living. The dark blue or purplish color is Western Resources, red is NAP, and the yellow counties are ILC. Jennifer, before you uh, go on, can I just um, see if there's any questions or I'd like to add a comment to help people understand the independent living because every program uh, developmental Disabilities has programs they refer to as independent living, the mental health system does, even service of blind and visually impaired. This independent living that Jennifer's presenting on is a time limited uh, set of services, not uh, always very intensive for someone who needs 24 hour services, 
but it's, it's time limited and it's connected with the independent living funding that comes out of the Rehabilitation Act. So um, I, I know there's many people from uh, community support providers here and understand that they're independent living in their group homes, apartments, or whatever, that has a different funding stream on today. Any other questions before Jennifer goes on to the assisted daily living services? Okay, go ahead, Jennifer. All right. Well, now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk to you about the second program that I manage, and that's the assistive daily living services, or ADLS for short. Um, assistive Daily Living Services is a Medicaid waiver program. Um, it provides supports to eligible individuals with quadriplegia to support them to live independently in their home, community, and workplace. Um, when I say that it's a Medicaid waiver program, what I'm referring to is that the program provides services to individuals who are on Medicaid above and beyond what Medicaid would normally cover for certain eligibility groups. And in this um, case, that's individuals who have quadriplegia. And that means um, impairments in all four of their limbs. Um, the waiver's been around for a while. It was originally created in 1994. The waiver also has an em emphasis on self-direction. Um, so that means that the participant is the person who manages the care they need, not an agency and not the state. The participant's in charge of the cares that they receive. To be eligible for the ADLS waiver, there's um, criteria set forth in administrative rules. Um, first one is that the person has to have quadriplegia, which is defined as limitation in all four extremities. The participants need to be 18 years of older. 18 years of age or older, the disability has to be permanent or likely to continue indefinitely. Um, they have to meet nursing facility level of care which means that if the person was not on the waiver and receiving ADLS services, they most likely would have to enter a nursing facility. Um, individuals on the program have to be medically stable. Um, they have to be Medicaid eligible, and they must be able to manage and self-direct their services or be able to select someone to manage and direct the services for them. Um, currently, we have 103 participants in South Dakota on the ADLS waiver. Um, now I'm going to discuss the services that we offer under the ADLS waiver. So these are the Medicaid services that Medicaid normally wouldn't provide, but that people receive because they're on the waiver. Um, personal attendant care is the key service for all waiver participants. Personal attendants provide a variety of in-home services that are considered to be activities of daily living. Um, these are things that would be impossible or very difficult for a waiver participant to do on their own. So this would include things like homemaking, dressing, grooming, feeding, things of that nature. Consumer preparation services, these are services that support the participant to hire and supervise their personal attendance. Um, the waiver is self-directed, so the participant is in charge of doing that, but providers provide consumer prep services to help teach the participant to do that and help them manage their cares. Um, In-home nursing is an option if um, there's something that a participant needs that a personal attendant is not qualified to provide. Um, this would be like if the participant had a wound that was infected, they need a nurse to come in and help them take care of that. That would be something the waiver would um, pay a nurse to come into the home to help them with. Um, In-home nursing services are physician ordered. So it's a physician saying this person needs this care um, and then the waiver helps support that. Emergency response services, um, ADLS can pay up to $45 a month for the monitoring service. This would be something like a lifeline, um, so somebody could get emergency response services if they had the need for that. Um, incontinence supplies or any supplies that support bowel or bladder maintenance, um, we can pay up to $200 per month um, for those supplies for participants, and I'm able to approve over that amount if needed. Um, in 2016, we did a amendment to the waiver and added some additional services, and those are what you're seeing on this slide. Um, the first one is specialized medical equipment and supplies. 
So that would be things like if somebody needed a scooter or a Hoyer lift, um, we could help purchase those devices for these individuals. Um, respite care is relief for the caretaker for participants that aren't able to be left alone. So if somebody needs 24-7 care, um, we could provide some respite relief, relief for their caretaker um, to give that person a break. Environmental accessibility adaptations. Um, this would be adding a ramp to a home if somebody had trouble accessing their house, widening a doorway so that their wheelchair could fit through, um, things of that nature. And then vehicle modifications would be lifts or tie downs or hand controls that the participant needs in order to um, transport in their vehicle. Um, we currently have three ADLS providers in the state. Um, two of them provide statewide services, independent living choices out of Sioux Falls and home care services out of Pierre. And then we also have preferred home health in Buffalo and they cover um, the west, western side of South Dakota. Um, these providers act as the third party employers for, for the personal attendants that provide the personal care to ADLS participants. And they're the ones who provide the consumer prep services and additional services under the waiver. Um, we're actually adding a fourth provider. Um, we're in the process of doing that and that provider is right at home and they're also out of Sioux Falls. Um, sometimes people will ask us what the benefit is to the ADLS waiver versus the um, waiver that's under adult services and aging. Um, currently the Department of Social Services. Um, the main difference is that this waiver is self-directed, so it's not the agency managing and directing the care, it's the participant, which means that they can hire a family member or friend as a personal attendant if they meet the hiring criteria of the provider. Um, they're the ones who are able to schedule their services, so if they have needs late at night or on weekends, they're able to do that when a traditional provider might not have PAs available. Um, they get to decide who's coming into their home and what services they're receiving. Um, big part of the self-direction piece is that it helps people in rural areas of the state by being able to hire your friends and neighbors and family if you're living somewhere where there isn't a traditional home health provider, they now have that option to hire somebody that they know to help them with their care to keep them in their own community. <clears throat> um, this slide is just um, showing you what the disability cause is for people who are on the ADLS waiver. Um, over a third of participants have had an injury to their spinal cord and another quarter, almost a quarter, have um, cerebral palsy. Um, I do want to make a note on referrals to the ADLS waiver. A lot of times people think that people have to have a full loss of use of all four of their extremities and that's not the truth. They just have to have an impairment. So somebody could apply for and be eligible for the waiver even if they have some use of some of their extremities. So keep that in mind if you know anybody who meets that criteria and could benefit from the waiver to make a referral to me and we could assess their eligibility. Um, once somebody applies for services, um, we have two service coordinators in the state who are the case manager to help the participant manage their care um, and services on the waiver. Um, we have Mary Lessel Young on the western side of the state. Her office is in Spearfish and that's the purple part of the map that you see. And then on the eastern side of the state we have Brooke Pape out of the Sioux Falls office. So those are our two service coordinators that work as case managers and their contact information is located on this slide as well. And that wraps up my presentation. Um, this is my contact information. You can feel free to give me a call or email me with any questions you may have um, on either of the programs I discussed today. Um, but I'll open it up for questions right now. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. And if there's any questions, uh, you either chat them or if you want to unmute your phone quick, we can ask Jennifer. 
Also, just remember that the two programs Jennifer presented on are two different distinct programs that she helps to oversee. And um, so is there any questions that people may have? Otherwise, I'll start bringing up the next presentation. Uh, and if Sorry, there is, Jennifer may be on for a little while, or also you had um, uh, her contact information there that you can feel free to uh, email her and to help answer any questions you may have. All right, thanks, Bernie. Thank you, Jennifer. At this point in time, I'm gonna turn it over to Kim Holberg, our business specialist. Uh, Kim, I'll let you take over the presentation. Kim, are you there? I don't hear you. I'm still not hearing you, Kim. Is that you, Kim? Yes. Are um, you able to hear me? Yeah, a lot of echoing. Did I accidentally uh, mute your uh, phone line? Uh, what's your you phone? may have. Yeah, can you do a star six? We'll unmute your phone. Because we're getting some echoing from your, um, um, I think it's pound six unmutes it. I'm sorry. Okay, this is still echoing. Yeah, you got your computer on and you're going through the phone? Are you using the phone line too, Kim? Yep, I'm using the phone line. Okay, how's the sound now? Try it. I did I, mute, so. Yeah. Is That's that better. better. Just got to talk a little louder. Okay. Apologize for that, everyone. Um, as Bernie mentioned, I am Kim Holberg, um, Business Specialist, Division of Rehabilitation Services. Um, during today's presentation, I'm going to cover the topics regarding the Employment First Initiative, South Dakota's Employment Work Task Force, my role as a Business Specialist with Division of Rehab Services, or DRS, along with um, Division of Rehab Services and Service to the Blind and Visually Impaired, emphasis on including businesses or employers as customers of VR, employer support services, a few initiatives that are in place that's focused on business-related areas, and the ability for hire initiative or campaign that Bernie mentioned earlier. Moving on to... Um, the next slide. You know, people with disabilities are an untapped workforce, and here are some statistics to prove that. In 2015, South Dakota's workforce consisted of 51.3% of people with disabilities employed in the workforce, which our state is the second highest in the nation. Wyoming is the first um, state in the nation with the highest percentage of um, people with disabilities employed in the workforce. During 2014, South Dakota was rated as the number one state. However, there were 83.9% of people without disabilities employed in South Dakota's workforce. So therefore, when you compare the two numbers, there's a um, gap of 32.6% between the employment rate of people with disabilities in comparison to those without. Therefore, as you can see, people with disabilities are an example of an untapped workforce. Um, to give you some nationwide statistics, during 2015, the overall employment rate in the U.S. for people with disabilities was 35.2% and 78.3% for people without disabilities. As you can see, there are significant gaps in the employment rates for those with disabilities. Hence, people with disabilities, again, are an untapped workforce. The Employment First Initiative. Um, Governor Dennis Dugard's Employment First Initiative was inspired by his involvement with the National Gover Governors Association, or the NGA. And the Employment First can be defined as a national framework 
for system change that is centered on the premise that all citizens, including individuals with significant disabilities, are capable of full participation in an integrated employment and community setting. During 2012 and 2013, NGA focused on exploring ways to increase employment opportunities for people with disabilities. Therefore, Governor Dugard wanted to do more in his own state to develop and maintain employment opportunities for South Dakotans with disabilities. So therefore, um, he, Governor Dugard announced his Employment Works Initiative during the spring of 2013, compiling a task force that um, created to, to help guide his efforts. Um, so therefore, beginning in July 2013, Governor Dugard assembled a broad spectrum of interest and um, which was considered integral for the success of the South Dakota Employment Works Task Force. So the task force members consisted of businesses, individuals with disabilities and their family members, legislators, nonprofit stakeholders, providers, and state agency representatives. So therefore, members were recruited from across the state and meetings began during August of 2013. The task force group met three separate times, resulting in recommendations being made, which there were five overall recommendations that were compiled into a document entitled the South Dakota Employment Work Task Force Report. So the five overall recommendations, as you can see on the PowerPoint or the slide, was first one, finding and supporting businesses to employ people with disabilities. Um, the first recommendation you know, kind of focuses on the representation of businesses on the task force, suggested having access to a primary point of contact for businesses within the scope of hiring people with disabilities which led to the creation of a business specialist position through the Division of Rehab Services. The second recommendation consists of connecting businesses to employees with disabilities. Part of this recommendation focuses on identifying the needs of businesses as far as matching them with qualified employees. The third recommendation addresses the elimination of disincentives to employment for people with disabilities. For example, provide education to beneficiaries, family members, and or providers uh, that are um, regarding SSI or SSDI benefits and employment. The fourth recommendation addresses the development of flexible systems and the promotion of promising practices. This recommendation highlights the importance of how people with disabilities may receive support and services from more than one agency at the same time. Therefore, interagency collaboration is important here. The last and fifth recommendation focuses on educating the public, providers, businesses, and people with disabilities. So therefore, education is the focal point of this recommendation, and there are several resources available regarding um, topics on disability-related areas. Moving on to the next slide, kind of just giving everyone an overview of my role. You know, again, I serve as a single point of contact at the state level for businesses located throughout the state to provide technical assistance and support when recruiting, hiring, retaining, or advancing employees with disabilities. My position, um, even though I'm based out of Aberdeen, um, I do cover the entire state, so just keep that in mind too. And when meeting with businesses, I can provide one-on-one -on -one or group technical assistance. Um, here are a few, few examples of how I have partnered with businesses. I've worked with businesses that have had multiple store locations throughout the state and have provided assistance with connecting them with a the local Division of Rehab Services or SBVI offices in the respective communities. I've also assisted businesses in understanding VR's process of clients and providers' roles when preparing for employment or beginning with employment 
or even maintaining employment. I've also met with businesses to answer questions and provide resources on the ADA. Reasonable accommodation, Section 503 regulations, which pertains to affirmative action hiring policies for federal contractors and subcontractors. And also benefits of hiring or employing people with disabilities um, to the business's bottom line versus about doing the right thing. Not only am I limited to providing technical support or partnering with businesses, I'm also here to support the public providers as well. Um, you know, support is available to work with all of you um, when, you know, when it comes to being able to effectively talk to businesses or educating you on some of the essential resources that's out there. A couple of resources that I want to highlight um, is the Job Accommodation Network or JAN. The Job Accommodation Network offers free expert and confidential guidance on workplace accommodations and disability employment issues. If you are interested in exploring the job accommodation, they do have a website and you can access that website at www.askjan.org. And um, they're available to help businesses, individuals with disabilities, rehab professionals, or providers you know, regarding any of the reasonable accommodation or workplace accommodation. The second one that I want to cover as a resource is the, what's called the Employer Assistance and Resource Network, or EARN. EARN provides businesses with free training or services regarding the recruiting, hiring, and retaining qualified individuals with disabilities. And to learn more about EARN, you can access their website at www.askearn.org. It's important to introduce yourself and visit with businesses in the language that they will understand, but which the next couple of slides will, I'll give you some examples. So here's an example to introduce yourself um, to a business. Hello, I'm Kimberly Holberg with the Division of Rehabilitation Services. We're an employment agency that provides recruitment assistance and employment consultation for local businesses. I was wondering if I could get 15 minutes of your time to learn more about your business. So that's an example of an um, introduction to how to introduce yourself to a business. And when talking to or about businesses, it's important to refer them as businesses versus employers due to the simple fact that they don't refer to themselves as employers. You know, in um, our profession, we do refer businesses as employers, and it's okay to um, communicate amongst each other as you know, business, or as employers. However, when visiting about businesses or to other business representatives, to just simply refer them as businesses. Going on to the next slide, here's some additional, um, you know, kind of that rehabilitation language versus the business language. You know, in our fields, we refer as VR clients. Um, as VR clients, however, to businesses, it's important to say job seekers or potential employees. And some other examples, you know, the rehab language of job development, simply um, discuss with businesses the recruitment assist assistance or assistance with finding applicants. Another example is assistive technology. When talking to businesses, it's important to um, relay reasonable accommodations. Job coaching, it's important to, instead of using job coaching, to just state retention support services. And natural support, it's just important to relay that training or coworker support offered by the business. Um, that's, you know, these are examples of some language where businesses will be able to better understand some of the services um, that we can provide. Now moving on to the next slide, dual customer approach. Historically, VR agencies have focused almost exclusively on serving the client with disabilities. However, in recent years, there has been a greater focus 
on including the needs of the business community and the VR focus. In recent years, several states have recognized the value of seeing the employer as a customer. As much as a person with a disability, therefore this is called the dual customer approach. It's important to establish and maintain employer contacts on an ongoing basis to build the rapport, understand their workforce needs, and effectively match them with qualified job seekers. Some examples of employer or business support services, and this can be defined as the consultation services provided by VR in response to the business's needs to recruit, hire, train, advance, or retain employees with disabilities. So some of the examples is you can see listed on the slide that consists of support services, finding qualified candidates with disabilities. You know, VR has that effective role in um, kind of pre-screening individuals that we work with. Um, the second one, assisting with questions related to the U.S. Department of Labor or the Office of Federal Contract Compliance, Section 503 regulations. As I mentioned earlier, this is um, affirmative action hiring policies apply to businesses that receive contracts from the federal agency, um, whether they're a federal contractor or subcontractor. The third one, providing disability etiquette training and training on the ADA for hiring managers. Solving issues related to the accessibility of technology or reasonable accommodations. Touring a business to gain an understanding of their culture, perform a job analysis, et cetera. Offering assistance and resources in obtaining an American Sign Language interpreter for a job interview. Delivering on-the-job assistance to a manager who has concerns about a socially awkward behavior that a new employee may be displaying. Providing assistance to human resources when a long-term employee's job performance begins to deteriorate. And the last one, assisting a hiring manager with providing accommodations with short-term memory loss for a new employee with a traumatic brain injury. Again, some of these are just examples and the list is not just limited to this, and additional support can be customized to businesses' needs or requests. Moving on to the next slide, some um, examples of employer business initiatives that the Division of Rehabilitation Services, or SBVI, is currently um, has in place. You know, some of the, you know, in addition to partnering with businesses on an individual basis, South Dakota's two VR agencies has also developed partnerships and or have memberships with some of the following business associations as listed on the slide. And again, please keep in mind that these memberships beyond, are beyond the traditional disability organization. So the first one you see listed is the South Dakota Retailer Association. A couple of years ago, we um, began to develop a good partnership with the Retailer Association. And some of the activities that we've partnered with the Retailer Association was we did give a couple of webinars, one in August of 2015 and another one in July of 2016. And in addition, South Dakota Retailer Association was part of what was called the Getting Down to Business Pilot Project through the Office of Disability Employment Policy, or ODEP. And they were involved in the pilot project. Um, it was focused on incorporating disability or diversity hiring inclusion policies for businesses. And they were part of the pilot project through January to September of 2016. Um, again, Chamber of Commerce and Society of Human Resource Management. So moving on to the next slide, business-led organizations. Presently, there are two nonprofit business-led organizations available in South Dakota. One in, is in Sioux Falls, which you may have heard of, that's called the Business Resource Network, and the other one is in Rapid City. And you have may also heard of this, 
and um, that entity is called the Workforce Diversity Network of the Black Hills. Both of these organizations are designed to provide education, awareness, and support to local businesses in their respective communities on the hiring, maintaining, and retaining individuals with disabilities. Additionally, in January of 2016, Division of Rehab Services also began, or began working with the remaining districts of Aberdeen, Brookings, and Yankton to develop additional business-led initiatives. All of the three communities are currently in their second year of contracts, which Aberdeen continues to work with Aberdeen Chamber. Brookings continues to work with the Brookings Area Human Resources Association, or BARA, and Yankton continues to work with the Yankton Chamber on these efforts. Steering committees have all been formed, and they meet monthly. All of the aforementioned entities receive funding assistance through a contract basis with Division of Rehab Services. In addition, um, Governor Dugard challenged for the state of South Dakota to become a model employer of people with disabilities which some of the efforts consist of Division of Rehab Services and Service to the Blind and Visually Impaired expanding the project skills and employment skills program within state agencies. And additionally, the Bureau of Human Resources is working on a number of different initiatives to expand disability-related knowledge levels to all state employees. As you can see um, on the slide, there is a breakdown of um, the numbers regarding the project skills and employment skills program expansion within state government. We began tracking this information about three years ago. So for year number one, which was based on the academic school year of 2014 through 15, we had set a minimum goal of five individuals to be able to work through project skills or the employment skills program. And for that year, we did achieve a total of 10 individuals. So for year two, which was the school year of 2015 through 16, we had a minimum goal of eight. We had eight individuals be able to work in project skills and employment skills program in state government. And we are in the third year, um, which our minimum goal is eight. We currently have eight working within state government. Moving on to the next slide, the 2017 summer initiatives. You may have heard last year we began funding um, what was called the 2016 summer initiatives, and it was focused on two different initiatives. For the first initiative, the, the pre-employment transition services for students with disabilities, and that's focused on the three areas of the Rehabilitation Services Act definition of pre-employment transition services. Um, you know, we're, again, Division of Rehab Services and Service to the Blind, Visually Impaired are interested in funding and training initiatives that focus on workplace readiness, training to develop social skills and independent living, instruction and self-advocacy, and information about VR services and other programs available to assist individuals with disabilities. Those participating in this initiative must be students with disabilities who are still enrolled with the secondary school. The students are not required to be clients of the VR program, but may potentially be eligible for VR services. So for the second initiative, which is focused on the employer-based work experience for VR clients, again, DRS, SBVI are interested in funding initiatives partnering with employers to provide VR clients with information, job shadowing, and opportunities to experience various jobs within businesses. This initiative will include classroom training to address how to search for jobs, complete applications, interviewing for jobs, and how to maintain employment. Training may also consist of specific skills training or certifications related to a specific business, such as CPR or serve safe training. Individuals participating in the second initiative must be currently receiving services from DRS or SBVI. Again, um, last year was the 
or last summer was the first year that we began funding these initiatives. We had a total of seven entities that were that participated in the first round, and we're currently um, in the process of accepting proposals from agencies or individuals participating in this. And the deadline for those proposals is March 31st, which is this coming Friday. So moving on to the next slide, there are three tax deductions or it incentives businesses may qualify for when employing or retaining employees with disabilities, which consists of the work opportunity tax credit or the WOTC, small business tax credit, or the architectural transportation tax deduction. However, for today's presentation, I would like to focus on the WOTC that is overseen by Department of Labor. How does the WOTC, or excuse me, let me back up here. Um, the WOTC is a federal income tax credit that's available to employers to hire individuals from certain targeted groups who consistently encounter higher rates of unemployment resulting from a variety of employment barriers. Recipients of VR services are eligible for this as long as they are referred by their VR counselors, have never previously worked for the employer, or is not a dependent or related to the employer. So moving on to the next slide, um, how does the WOTC benefit employers or businesses? The tax credit is applied during the first year of employment, so full credit of up to $2,400 is given to employers when qualifying employees work a minimum of 400 or more hours. And partial credit is given to businesses of up to $2,500 when qualifying employees have worked a minimum of 120 hours and have not exceeded more than 400 hours. Now, the Ability for Hire initiative, which um, you may have all heard about. So Division of Rehab Services launched the Ability for Hire campaign or initiative beginning in August of 2015, and it's designed to deliver information, outreach, and resources to businesses, job seekers, and the public workforce system to ensure greater recruiting and hiring opportunities for job candidates with disabilities. The purpose is to better inform, connect, and communicate with all stakeholders in the disability and employment system to be a catalyst for a more inclusive workforce in South Dakota. As a result, various materials have been completed, and some of those materials consist of videos featuring Governor Dennis Lugard businesses and individuals with disabilities sharing their success or testimonials but some of the videos were actually featured as commercials. Um, printed material in the form of, we've got three different brochures, one for job seekers, one for businesses, and a third one for um, youth with disabilities. And if you currently don't have any of the, print, the brochures, you can obtain them at your local VR offices. There's also a website, which um, if you haven't seen it, do encourage you to visit, and that is abilityforhire.com. Did also do a radio announcement along with a Facebook page. And that leads to the next slide. Um, I want to open it up for questions. Uh, my contact information is also available if you want to reach out to me at a further time, but I would like to open it up to questions. Kim, this is Bernie. Um, I think if you back up, uh, I'm going to back it up to a few slides um, to this partial credit. Is that what's shown on your screen? Um, For the WOTC? Yeah, WTC. Someone commented that they said it was $1,500 instead of $2,500. Okay. That was probably a typo, so... Okay. My mistake. And I think it has to be at least 120 hours uh, or something like that. So, yeah, that one, uh, someone had a question that may not be uh, 
you know, uh, if someone does have some questions on the WTC, uh, Department of Labor has that information. Am I correct? They're also on our site too? Yep, that is correct. And actually, um, you can visit with a local Department of Labor office or there's a state coordinator, um, Peggy Carrico, based out of Aberdeen, who is state WOTC coordinator. Okay. Uh, I do recommend people go to the, um, the Ability for Hire website. Uh, really good videos. If you ever have employers that you're dealing with that are questioning about what the job developer is doing or um, the role or benefits of hiring people with disabilities, that is a very good uh, website to go to. Is there other questions you may have for Kim Holberg? Kim is in our Aberdeen office. Um, you know, if you're in that area or you know, phone number for Aberdeen office, just feel free to um, give a call on to that. And I'm just getting ready to bring up my next presentation here. Um, is that now? Okay. I'm going to kind of cover, uh, this is Bernie Grimmie, and I'm going to cover a bunch of other programs that I feel are important for um, agencies and providers to be aware of. Uh, some of these I may go through kind of fast. I have a number of slides, but I do want to cover them as I do feel they are important to be addressing into there. And again, if you have questions, uh, feel free to uh, ask them. Um, so anyway, Division Rehab Services, it is to assist individuals ability, uh, individuals disabilities attain employment or self-sufficiency, personal independence and full inclusion society. I do want people to understand that um, our org chart and how this work in our field offices, um, Eric Weiss is our division director. And then I oversee the five district supervisors, which oversees all the counselors and counselor aides and support staff. Uh, in the middle, we have program specialists. You heard two of them today. Um, you heard uh, Kim Holberg and you heard Jennifer Guther. And we also have, and I'll talk a little bit about it later, is our disability termination um, uh, program in Sioux Falls, as they are really connected with Social Security Administration and they do the disability aspects of determining if someone should be on disability services or not. We also have two advisory boards uh, that fall in the Division of Rehab Services. We have the Board of Vocational Rehabilitation has 15 members. Majority of them have to be individuals with disabilities um, and past VR clients. Uh, Kim Holberg is a board member. Uh, I seen Darla uh, McGuire on here too today. I thought uh, she is also on our board and she'll be ending her term this June. So there's a couple of positions being filled there. Uh, we also have the statewide independent living council, about 17 members and majority of happy people with disabilities. And I'm on that council. Uh, I didn't recognize any other names on there, but it's usually people that more on um, independent living services that Jennifer Guthier was talking about earlier. Disability termination services, you know, they want to provide accurate, impartial, and timely decisions to South Dakota uh, citizens with disabilities who are applying for, to be eligible for Social Security benefits. And um, it's, if people are confused about this sometimes because there is your Social Security Administration, but we have our disability termination services, which is part of our division that works specifically for the Social Security Administration. So um, this is some information about our disability termination program that it has to be by reason of medical determination or physical or mental impairment. Uh, the disability has to be uh, more permanent, it has to last more than 12 months. We do get calls once in a while that um, uh, a person has got just uh, broke their leg. They don't know if, if there's any disability benefits for them. And, there isn't any for this. So um, I know if you work a lot with people with disabilities, uh, you probably have understanding of their impairments, the level of impairment they would need to be eligible 
Um, the people can apply online. Uh, there's kind of a lengthy process onto there. I know the Centers for Independent Living, uh, the one in Rapid City and one in Sioux Falls do help individuals apply for Social Security benefits at times, as well as I think many of your agencies are probably assisting individuals to apply for um, Social Security. Assistive technology uh, services and devices is a, a, a part of our division. Steve Stewart is our program specialist uh, handling that. He is, uh, we consider our rehabilitation engineer. That's his email address. Uh, most of the assistive technology may go through his uh, desk one way or another, but our field offices are typically using Dakota Link when we are assisting an individual um, to uh, obtain assistive technology uh, typically for training or for work that they may need a computer with assistive devices. We're seeing a lot more on some iPhones um, and some of the apps that are available to help individuals, especially some of those individuals with uh, uh, intellectual disabilities. And uh, we are looking at having uh, Dakota Link do a presentation at our fall conference on some of those newer technologies on there. So there's a website. Uh, they have a, a lot of good resources out there and information. But usually if it's involving employment, our VR counselor is involved in there. But one thing to keep in mind that if you're doing the long-term supports and this person was a VR client uh, and there's some problems happening with assistive technology or you think you could use more assistive technology to help support that person, get back to that VR counselor and talk to them about having Dakota Link assist into there because most of the individuals will get involved with doing um, an evaluation first and then based upon that evaluation, uh, what types of assistive technology would we provide for the individual? Another important program for people to realize is I call them our tribal vocation rehabilitation uh, programs. Um, what you see here is a map of all of our the reservations that are across the state. Yeah. And with, uh, I think there's probably 11 of them, if I count them, there is five tribal voc rehab programs that um, they receive their funding directly from um, Rehabilitation Services Administration. And those five are Pine Ridge, uh, Cheyenne River Standing Rock. We have um, we have the one on uh, Standing Rock that kind of goes across North Dakota and South Dakota borders. We have Lower Brule. And we have a new one uh, with Rosebud Sioux Tribe. And again, this is where the tribes enter into agreement directly. Uh, they have to apply for these grants with Rehabilitation Service Administration, but they run a parallel voc rehab program. Many of the cases may be jointly with the state voc rehab, but some may be just with those tribal voc rehab programs. I want to talk a little bit about provider services, uh, some initiatives that we have going on. Um, one deals with a program guide that we have in place, establishes three sets of types of providers. There's provider type one is our existing providers as community support providers, uh, our mental health centers, typically our career learning centers. And we don't need to do contracts with them or any special arrangements or authorizations uh, are in place for them or to establish a contractual arrangement. Provider type number two, we use once in a while, it's a consumer certified provider and they have to complete a form, the individual and the person. And I'm gonna give you an example. Let's say that uh, we have a person who wants to work in a, a nursing home or a restaurant in Mobridge, South Dakota, where there isn't a provider available, but there is a coworker that is willing to uh, train him or her in how to do those job tasks and basically be the job coach that we can hire directly. And so that is what the consumer certified provider is. Um, sometimes we'll do on the job training uh, funding to employers, but sometimes that doesn't assure the individual receives the level of training that the person may need. So sometimes we're better off contracting directly with an individual for that consumer certified provider. Um, also, uh, the other one is uh, private providers that based upon their education, experience and training, there's, we can approve them just for the level of job coaching. 
um, or and follow along, or if they have more education experience, we can approve them for all those categories of services into them. And those providers are approved on like two year increments and they have to uh, submit an application, go through a criminal records um, um, test, and then if we approve them, that we'll issue an agreement with them. I want to talk a little bit about initiative. We started out some years ago um, that we started uh, where we are funding uh, examinations for providers to take uh, to become a certified employment support professional. It's $159. Uh, provider pays for it up front and then sends me the invoice and I will reimburse them. And this is for the initial examination. I won't reimburse for the renewal examinations that has to happen every three years. Um, also, when the provider passes the examination and they complete a two-day person center training, um, we will reimburse them at a 25% higher fee rate for the services that individual provides directly. So if you have three job coaches, um, job developers in the agency, the one that is certified and done the two-day person center training, that one will pay a 25% higher. The other one will do our normal fee rate. And our current fee rates are on um, the website, uh, about the same site where you'll see all these handouts. So, and the, the reason we wanted to do this was um, we wanted to uh, promote people to have a higher skill level to uh, for providers and to help maintain providers, make sure that they'll continue to be support services but also that uh, so providers will uh, participate in some continuing education credits uh, every three years to uh, keep the renewal of the CESP. They have to turn in their uh, attendance, continuing education uh, certificates that they have received during the course of those years. So um, all the requirements are on the APC website and they have it listed there. We do have um, a certification training coming up in I think it's like April 5th or something like that uh, in Sioux Falls and then we're having another one right before the fall conference uh, October uh, 2nd in Pierce South Dakota I also want to point out uh, this is where we have all our information our handouts but we have a document called our service descriptions for VR providers that our staff went through quite a bit of detail in explaining the various types of services and especially job placement when you have different incentives. When does um, the different incentives pay out? And we did put you know, more detail into that. We have our fee schedule out there and that's where I'll be posting it. Um, Usually July 1st is when we update, either June 1st or July 1st, we update a fee schedule. I'm not sure we're going to do this year because I think across the board there hasn't been any provider inflation or a very, very small percent. So we're not quite sure what we're going to do on to there. Situational assessment form is out there. We have an independent living assessment forms. Um, and then we also have some information on authorizing project skills and our employment skills program out there. I'm going to talk a little bit about support and employment. Uh, many of the agencies here are community support providers, so I want to talk about what it is and what has changed with our reauthorization that happened a couple of years ago, because there was a few changes that impacted support and employment. Um, a little bit of background on support and employment. It resulted in the Rehabilitation Act that was issued in 1973. And the last time regulations were issued were in 1997 until I think it's like this last year is when the new regulations came out. So it's almost like 20 years before new regulations were implemented. Support employment is a separate stream of federal funds for division rehab services and with no match. But there was a little change on the match this year. I'll talk about that in a minute. In South Dakota, being a small state, we get what we call a minimum allotment, which is $300,000 per year. 
And so it's pretty well $300,000 at straight federal funds that uh, we have to use specifically for individuals who are identified as supported employment. Couple things to really remember with supported employment is the philosophy behind it is to place and train individuals on the job versus training them in a segregated environment with intent to placing them. Supported employment is also uh, for individuals with the most significant disabilities who need ongoing supports to keep their employment. And again, this is typically the community support providers, mental health centers. And one thing that's been very good in South Dakota is um, the developmental disability system has not had a waiting list like many other states. So when individuals are coming to voc rehab and they're going to be needing support and employment, they already have those long term supports and uh, VR will step in and do some job placement and job coaching, other types of services. And meantime, the developmental disability funding has continued to uh, be going at that point in time. You know, there's, we talk more and more about natural supports and what they are. Uh, for individuals who are in support employment, it always doesn't have to be a paid support. It can be a family member or a business that's providing the natural supports. But you got to keep in mind that um, is there needs to be that mechanism in place for that person to be successful. So it's easy to say there's natural supports, a parent is going to do that, but if they're not going to be uh, around all the time available to do it, or the counting part of self-employment, you got to look at some other means for that. A little bit more of some background on support employment. Um, South Dakota had a system change in 1995 to 2000, and we still implement some of those initiatives that came out of that, such as the private providers, uh, our transition liaisons um, came out of that initiative. We did some uh, training on downsizing shelter workshops or helping agencies to get people more in the community. Um, or also we worked on some policies um, that promoted community employment. So um, Probably the, um, the only downfall that ever really happened is as we moved more people out into supported employment, there were still more people coming into sheltered employment. And I know there's a number of agencies that have made a lot of significant improvements throughout the years of helping people with community employment. And that's also why we did establishment grants to make job developers, more job developers uh, there to assist individuals to obtain community employment. A few other changes that happened uh, throughout the time for voc rehab. You know, at one time we could close individuals' uh, cases successfully employed in sheltered employment. I think that changed in like the early 90s or something like that. We weren't really doing much before then, but uh, some states probably were doing more of that. Also, VR was had the option of closing people's case too severely disabled. Um, that is no longer an option. If we close them uh, too severely disabled, you know, we have to really uh, be able to justify that and be able to show them opportunity for some community employment first. We have helped with some partnerships and providers. And again, we've also done establishment grants with many of the providers across the state. We developed a couple different memorandums, understanding with developmental disabilities and mental health. I believe they're on the website. If not, I'll double check, make sure they do get out there. It does talk about how the funding sources do work together. So if you don't have a copy of that or don't understand that policy, do let me um, get a hold of me. I'll help explain that for you. Um, I do also want to point out that in 2014, South Dakota had the highest percent of individuals in VR closed successfully in supported employment than any other um, state. And a couple years ago, I was looking at um, our comparison with North Dakota and uh, our wages and our hours of earnings for our people successfully closed was much lower than North Dakota's. But when you start looking at their information, they really weren't serving people with more significant impairments and they weren't serving people in supported employment where we have had that partnership with agencies. 
for a number of years and to serve and aid individuals in support and employment with community support providers. And because of that, we probably have individuals that are uh, in employment for 10 hours or sometimes even less on to them. Well, and then July 22nd, 2014 came reauthorization. And then in June, we had our new regulations, which they provided more details than we ever had before. And again, it was 20 years past since we had new regulations for support employment. So a couple of things that changed with support and employment is, well, South Dakota still only gets $300,000. And um, that part hasn't changed, but one thing that did happen was half of the support and employment funds had to be used for youth with disabilities. And that half had to be, um, have a 10% match requirement on there. So we have to spend $150,000 plus their 15,000 for supported employment with youth with disabilities. And then we have to, um, one of the things that's changed and providers may have noticed this is support employment funds can only be used now when a person's in employment. We used to be able to do an authorization with um, community support providers that would say job placement, job coaching and follow along and even a situational assessment was all on there. Now you're probably seeing those in two different authorizations because job placement is before the employment. Situational assessment is before uh, the employment. So you may see those in one authorization using our basic BR funds, and you may see job coaching and follow along using supportive employment funds. Support employment services were extended from 18 months to 24 months. Uh, we typically never went beyond that 18 months uh, anyway, unless there were some extenuating uh, reasons. Another thing that's happened um, with the re new regulations is support employment can fund youth and individuals who are youth are, they are 24 and under. Um, can be funding them for 48 months and keep their cases open. This is probably more situations where uh, states that their developmental disability is, um, they have a waiting list. And in the past, VR could not start serving people the waiting list until supported employment funds were released. So what happens is basically the VR with support employment funds can be used for a period of time until that waiting list funds become open. You know, um, there's a new option in there called short term basis employment less than minimum wage in, in integrated setting, not more than six months. You know, I'm not sure where that would ever be a good example of where we would do a situation. You know, if it's integrated setting, the business is paying that and the business is paying minimum wage. Um, the only option would be is if a uh, community support provider had some form of contract with the business first onto there. And I haven't got a good example to show where that could even fall into there. Any questions so far with what I've talked about so far? Because one of the code words is going to be supported that you need to enter in for the survey. So make sure you take a note of that. And then I'm gonna proceed with some of the changes that resulted from the Workforce Innovation Opportunities Act. And what this means for schools, students with disabilities and service providers. And uh, this came about here a couple years ago. We had a number of changes with our reauthorization of, and when I talk about reauthorization, the Rehabilitation Act, you know, the Rehab Act is one portion of, of the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. There's like four titles and rehab is title four into there. So this was signed by President Bush in uh, 1998. I'm sorry, in 2014, the previous version was 1998. And again, I mentioned it had four different titles into there. Invoke Rehab is title four. And when I say reauthorization and rehab act, I'm always referring to vocational rehabilitation into there. 
But there are a couple of things that um, underneath uh, in the voc rehab section, um, you heard Kim Holberg talk about section 503. Um, there's also section 504, which typically um, you see a lot of times in schools, secondary schools that they call them um, a 504 student. And bas it's basically a student who has a disability. It just needs accommodation to participate in the class. So it may be an interpreter. It may be the class at the lower level, um, whatever it may be. And you see this a lot also in the college and it's basically agencies that receive federal funds have to provide reasonable accommodations. And of course, Section 511 is the newest one that deals with subminimum wage. And what you see happening here is these sections in the 500s don't always pertain to voc rehab, but they typically always pertain to individuals with disabilities. So um, there's 11 of them right now, and but Section 504 and Section 511 is the two most common ones that um, book rehab and providers are dealing with. A couple key dates on um, regulation changes from WIOA. And, you know, the act was signed July 22nd, 2014. But in two years later is when Section 511 where subminimum wage took full effect. So there was a two year time period where people could, and agencies could get more prepared for this, but the two years went pretty fast. And there seemed to be a lot of people that still don't understand what section 511 was. There were some key definitions that came out of uh, the reauthorization, uh, student disability, youth with disability. And I'll talk a little more about all these, the pre-employment transition services, the competitive integrated employment, transition services. And I do wanna talk about the role of employer and the role of employee in these definitions. Student with disability is basically uh, between the ages of 16 and 21. And we follow our state law. So if they're um, 20, one before July 1st, they can still be a student with disability for another year. And so we follow that state law onto there. So we also have a student with disability may also consider someone who is in a post-secondary, but still a student. Um, we also have there are some exceptions on state law and the DOE implementation of IDA, the Individual Education Act. And um, there is some pre-employment transition services where VR is involved. And this is gonna be the schools and VR's responsibility onto there. Youth with disabilities um, is not younger than 14 and is not older than 24 years of age. So to clarify that, a youth with disability is under 25. So uh, when it says not older than 24 years of age, so it's gonna be literally under 25. And the reason they define this in the intent of Congress was youth with disabilities need to be given opportunities to, um, to ensure that they have the potential or the opportunity to achieve competitive integrated employment. Here's a chart I put together that helps uh, people understand the what youth with disability is and what the students with disabilities. Students with disabilities is just a subset of the youth. And do keep in mind, we will see eventually students who are no longer involved with the school system become youth with disabilities. And that doesn't mean they can automatically start sub minimum wage employment. There is some different requirements that have to be met on there. And I will get a little bit more into those subminimum wage requirements in a few minutes, but I do want to talk about what the pre-employment transition services are. And um, ideally, the best situation is that these pre-employment transition services occur while the individual is in high school, in that secondary school setting. 
if you're a provider and you're attending individual education or your, your IEP meetings with these students, have that discussion about pre-employment transition services, If even if that person's not gonna be going into sheltered employment. You know, it need be made available for all individuals, all students with disabilities, but unfortunately not all students with disabilities are referred to voc rehab. And the five services that uh, fall under pre-employment transition services, uh, job exploration counseling, work-based learning experiences in an integrated environment. And that's an important concept is that integrated environment. I know there's agencies that are coming up with training programs in their day program, their segregated environment. That's not gonna count as work-based learning. Work-based learning is gonna be situational assessments. It's gonna be volunteering out in the community. And of course, project skills is one of the better examples onto there. Post-secondary education counseling, that's making people available, uh, making information available to individuals about post-secondary. Our transition project has catch the wave activities that individuals can attend. Um, there's also some uh, 18 to 21 programs I call within um, the state, such as uh, Sioux Falls and Rapid City have some programs. But some of that could be happening just from discussion with a voc rehab counselor. The fourth one is workplace readiness training to develop social skills and independent living skills. And I do feel that if a person is referred to voc rehab, they're going to get those first four fairly easy. The instruction with advocacy and the self advocacy is a little harder to identify into there. So, you know, it's important that we're having a discussion with the school about these free five pre employment transition services. And we just need to be able to show that before a person goes into submitting wage, they've had some of these opportunities. Competitive integrated employment, we just did our new policy. Our three main requirements are there. There has to be the full or part-time work at minimum wage or higher. And it has to be similar to what individuals who, without disabilities are performing. And it has to be fully integrated with coworkers without disabilities. And there has to be the opportunities for advancement available to all individuals. And I know that's gonna be hard with small businesses because there's not a lot of opportunities for anyone advancement in some small businesses, but it needs to be the same level. What's integrated under WIOA? Um, workplace has to be able to interact with coworkers, customers, the same extent employees with disabilities, and interacting only with a supervisor or a community support staff or your job coach is not sufficient into there. This definition has changed. We have defined our policy and if there's any question of a job site that is not meeting that competitive integrated employment, talk to the VR counselor. We come up with an assessment tool that the counselor can um, assess the individual's job site a little bit more for clarification. A couple of these I'm just gonna kind of pass through a little bit. Um, I do wanna emphasize um, the difference of employee employer and how our different systems view these individuals. You know, uh, in the school, they're going to view this person as a student. The community support provider is going to view this person as a person served. And of course, a voc rehab is going to view this person as a client. Section 511 views this person as an employee. So if this person is at a community support provider at a shelter workshop or group model or whatever, they are a person served, but they're also an employee. And that means the community sport fighter is gonna take the role of employer. And that's probably one of the biggest challenges I'm seeing agencies struggle with is they're putting on their hat for a service provider, but when they're paying wages, they are an employer. Just like how your supervisor, uh, you're being paid under an agency, there are wage and hour requirements that have to be met, and you are an employee just like that person working in the shelter workshop. I'm gonna kind of jump through this a little bit. Um, the pre-employment transition services, one thing I will point out is we do have to spend a certain amount of money for pre-employment transition services for students with disabilities. We are tracking that. And of course, project skills is one of the bigger portions of that. And these are some of the other costs that we have 
that are counting towards that 15%. Um, I mentioned the support employment earlier about how we have to have that money set aside for that. Let me talk about the Section 511 law because I'm dealing with these definitions that um, the student disability and the youth with disability and the pre-employment transition services and those all tie into the Section 511 law. And the intent was that individuals with disabilities, especially those with youth, have the opportunity to uh, obtain or maintain um, competitive integrated employment, that they're not directly going from a school to a sheltered work and people think that's the only thing they can do, that opportunity has to occur to there. I do have a copy of the laws and regs and a lot of other documents on this website listed there. And um, how this impacts students with disabilities and schools in the secondary school system is schools can't contract for sub minimum wage employment. And um, I see in a few schools still doing this. Um, they, they can't, they can do project skills. They can contract with a community support provider to do transition classes or other activities. Um, I've seen some um, of those that are opened up and developed. Uh, Lifescape has recently did a grand opening of their uh, program that they have that works with students with disabilities. There's some of the other programs that are, um, while the person is a student that are doing more meaningful transition services, but they just can't have the person go to uh, shelter work and do some minimum wage employment. You know, when I talk about the Section 511, there's, there's three kind of requirements so that the school's not doing sub minimum wage employment is one of them. The second one is when the person is a youth, and there is some limitations on when a person is youth, and they cannot start the sub minimum wage employment until these following conditions are met. And the first are, you know, the person has received the, free, the five pre-employment transition services that are previously defined. The person has ser been served or been determined ineligible by VR, and their case has to be closed. You can't just uh, have a person show up to your day program uh, today and make a referral to voc rehab and assume you can start doing some minimum wage employment. They've got to go through the whole VR process, and until that case is closed, can you legally do some minimum wage employment? And you got to keep in mind that you're now in that employer role. Um, the individual's also been provided career counseling, information, uh, referrals, model programs and services. And uh, one thing it did have for individuals that were already working sub minimum wage or youth is if they were already doing sub minimum wage before the regulation, before the act went into effect. So if they were doing sub minimum wage July 22nd, 2016, they could continue on with your sub minimum wage like they had been before. We do recommend that those individuals do get referred to voc rehab, but it's not the same requirement as if they start on or after July 22nd. I mentioned earlier uh, about the individual when they referred to voc rehab, we develop a plan. We try to we probably do some situational assessments and community employment. Um, and until the case is closed, can they do some minimum wage employment? Now, for adults um, or individuals already receiving some minimum wage employment, and um, we need to do periodic reviews. And if a person would start sub minimum wage employment today, and uh, if they were a youth and met all the requirements or they were older than 25 years old, we would have to do a periodic review in six months, and we would have to do another one uh, six months later. And after that, we just repeat annually. Um, the individual and the family um, is given the results. Uh, we provide a copy of the to the sub minimum wage agency, uh, and they are to give those documents out to the individuals. 
and they're also maintaining a copy for their records. And uh, we have contracted these reviews out to um, three reviewers, and they pretty well have gone through all the reviews across the state. We have a few left in Mitchell, and uh, I think a few left in um, Brookings, and we have um, um, maybe a few left in Watertown. I think Lifescape is pretty well finished up. So most of the agencies we've already gone through, we're seeing a couple of them that are happening in the six month reviews now. Here is uh, a good little chart I put together for a student, youth, or adult. So if this person falls in a student, they can't do some minimum wage activities. They need to be offered pre-employment transition services. And if some minimum wage happens, um, after school completion must be referred to VR before uh, completing school. So this kind of talks about the three categories into there uh, as far as student, youth, and adult. Our role in uh, Section 511, um, we are doing the role of doing reviews and uh, providing the documentation. It is the and I refer to 14C employer. Those are the employers that do sub minimum wage. It's their role and responsibility to make sure the reviews happen and they get the information to Voc Rehab. And it's also their responsibility to make sure the documentation is maintained. If Department of Labor would come in and do a review, they're going to ask that community support provider um, for their documentation. They're not going to come back to Voc Rehab and ask for it. So, and then um, also showing there is Department of Labor is the enforcing agency. So if an individual has a complaint or if we see that the law is not is being violated, we would just contact the Department of Labor, um, their wage and hour division. I mentioned we contracted out the three reviewers um, and we um, getting pretty close to being done with those reviews. If you are a community support provider and, um, and this student is now becoming a youth, this is the form of documentation that you should have in your file. And this documents the five pre-employment transition services. So it's really important that if you're going to uh, an IEP in a school system that you're talking to the school about um, the pre-employment transition services and the documentation, because it is a counselor and the, v and the school who need to put this documentation together for you. And you're probably gonna see uh, a lot of schools that are confused. There's a lot of turnover sometimes in a special ed department. They have a lot of other requirements, and so this level of documentation is probably just not the highest priority for them. This forum is on our website, and the school should maintain a copy. The employer, which is a 14C employer, should maintain a copy in their file also. Um, I'm going to skip over the establishment grants. I talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, I do want to open it up at this point in time questions you may have but I did also want to point out that uh, I did send out a, um, a listing of all the trainings uh, an updated list of all the trainings that are coming up uh, I, I have everyone on my uh, an email list if you're not getting my email list on trainings do let me know and I'll add you I try to get all the job coaches and all the job developers added to that email list of course there are people with changes uh, leaving or changing agencies. I um, also want to mention that our fall conference is coming up October 2nd, 3rd, and 4th in Pier. We do move that around every year, so um, providers and the local communities do have more of an opportunity to uh, attend those trainings. And again, that'll be in, in Pier, and we are doing a certification uh, that morning. Um, before the fall conference start. We always have a provider track uh, for the fall conference and uh, a VR track and a disability track, usually a transition track into there. And we'll be sending out the mark the calendar either at the end of this week or beginning of next week. Uh, last year we had a Deadwood and we had about 250 people um, who attended that. 
And the theme this year is going to be building bridges. Um, uh, going to be building bridges with a strong foundation, on a strong foundation. So at this point in time, I went through a lot of this stuff pretty fast. We have a lot of different programs. Uh, I believe most people have. There's my email address. I also want to point. I'll bring up here quick, um, just to do closing on the site again for um, to do the survey. And the last word is employment that you'll need to enter in as a code word. And here is the. Um, the site to enter in um, for the survey. And if I know a couple of people said they had some problems with the link, if you do, just send me an email and I will send you um, um, the direct link on that. I'm not sure what the problem is. It was just not copying out or what it may be, or if I've got a type wrong. It seems to be what I have typed there is what the link is. So, um, you need to do the, the survey by April 7th. After April 7th, I, we download the file and that's when we send out the continued education credits. You do need to enter the two code words I mentioned earlier. Um, otherwise, um, that's the only way we can ensure that people participated or listened to the session. So even if you didn't, um, weren't able to be here today and listen to it, you can watch it when I get it posted on the website. And as long as you do the survey by April 7th, you can still get the continuing education credit onto there. So with that, we're about 20, 20 minutes away. We closed up a little bit earlier. I kind of rushed through a few things fast, but I do want to take this time and opportunity for any questions that people may have. I've seen Darla's on there. Do I make her pick her out to ask a question? I'm looking for names. Let me go down the bottom. Any questions from anyone? We had over 60 some people on today, um, which is a pretty good turnout onto this. So again, the handouts are all on this site. And also under that provider resources site, you'll see our policies. We have a whole folder for section 511 and um, uh, a lot of good information. If they think there's some documents that'd be helpful for providers to have, uh, they are also out there. I know that uh, one of the first sessions, there was a template provider reports and template billings um, that were made available. Um, so the provider is using Excel spreadsheet that seems to work pretty well. So if there's some resources, um, feel free to use them. Um, I didn't mention the Kenfield trainings. Uh, we have funded those uh, webinars. Um, we are still funding those webinars uh, through Kenfield Consulting. If you don't have that information on there, just let me know and I can send you the link and how to uh, connect to the Ken Kenfield Consulting. So other than that, Darla says she's got no questions. She enjoyed listening to it the last four weeks. And again, you'll be getting your continuing education credits when you do the surveys. Um, but it'll be after the 7th for this one. And the one I did the other day, the 20th, uh, you'll probably get here later this week. So other than that, we're done. You guys have a good day. And otherwise, email me if you have any questions.